Yeah, if you didn't know, I actually used Josh and Aaron myself for some of our bigger deals. So I can say that when things start to get a little bit tough on a deal, they really do push through and like we get the deal done. That's what really matters. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here and in today's video we catch up with the boys from Finlay Mortgages and discuss with them down payments. Now a lot of new real estate investors are constantly trying to figure out how can I buy this property, how can I buy this investment and put as little of my own money into the deal as possible. So in today's video we're going to explore the different requirements when it comes to your down payments on your investment properties and the guys are going to share with us some tips and tricks that they've came across over their years financing mortgages in regards to how to get into a deal with the little amount of a down payment as possible. Let's dive in to today's video. What is up YouTube? Matt McKeever here and we've got the mortgage guys back. So I've got Josh and Aaron with me from Finlay Mortgages and today we're going to be talking about down payments. So I think this is an area that a lot of investors get confused by. They're a little bit lost in regards to, I'm sure you guys come across it all the time because investors are constantly wondering how little can I get away with putting down on this property because they're always trying to stretch the dollar so we can get into another deal. Of course. So in today's video the guys are really going to break down for us just kind of piece by piece what's going on when it comes to down payments here in Canada. So let's start off with residential. Yeah, yeah, let, let's start off with residential uh, residential down payments there. You want to take this one away? Yeah, absolutely. So on, on the residential side, um, you know, we're going to have, let's start off with our AAA mortgage. Um, so starting out, you know, we're going to take a look at if you're purchasing, you know, an insured property with one of the insurers. So you got CMHC, Canada Guarantee, and Genworth. Um, on the insured side, you know, you're able to get away as long as it's a one to two unit. Um, five percent down payment uh, as the minimum um, up to you know under the 20% and then you move up into an, an insured product um, there's a few different types of things that you're gonna be able to take a look at that you can use towards your down payment um, so one of them is gonna be obviously like your own cash savings um, so whether that's a checkings account something that's coming out of like a TFSA um, as a first-time home buyer you are allowed to withdraw all of your RSPs as well too so um, with your RSPs it's gonna be $35,000 for each applicant one of the most uh, asked questions that we usually get is down payment for residential mortgages and what does that down payment look like so we like to go through two different types of down payment one is called traditional down payment methods and non-traditional down payment methods so primarily traditional down payment methods are going to be safe from your own funds um, they're going to be either a gift from a family member savings uh, you can use RSP so the first time home buyer plan allows you to use up to thirty five thousand dollars per person for RSP contribution. Um, that being said, there is some sort of limit when it comes to using your RSPs for your down payment. Um, you're gonna be required to pay that back over 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and basically the amount of money you take out is gonna be tranched into 15 different pieces and you're gonna have to pay that back proportionately to the year that you, that you would have to put it back into your account. Um, other than that, you have to make sure that the funds are in your account for 90 days. They have to be sourced specifically because a lot of banks and financial institutions have any money laundering laws that they are required mm -hmm. to follow. So those are really, really important. So if you have put money in your bank account and you can't source it, you can't use that income. So don't come to us and say, hey, I got 60 grand in my bank account. Yeah. I put it in last month. I, I, we can't help you, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. There are certain requirements that banks do need to meet. Um, for non-traditional down payment methods, that is something called like borrowing your down payment. Yeah. So most AAA banks don't allow it, but B lenders do, and there are a few requirements that they look at. So one is that you can only borrow up to 10% of your down payment in non-traditional down payment methods. So for example, if you had a line of credit or if you had a, a loan, for example, um, you could use those funds for your down payment. Something to keep in mind is it goes directly towards your total debt service ratio. Yeah. So we have to factor that monthly payment into your total monthly liabilities and then calculate your uh, your qualification that way. So, I mean, it does help in certain situations, but depending on the situation you're in, it may hinder you as well. So mm -hmm. I think just make sure to have your mortgage broker crunch those numbers before you know, taking a look at 
borrowing the funds for your down payment. Yeah, and let's maybe just explore that a bit because I'm sure the audience is going to have questions in regards to trying to access, say, a home equity line of credit or just a general line of credit to help them with down payment funds. So do you guys mind just clearing up for the audience? If I borrow that money 90 days out and just let it sit in the bank account, is that now acceptable in regards as long as my total debt service ratio is on side? Yep, so there's a few things you can do. You can borrow funds and actually put it in your RRSPs as long as it's there for 90 days. If you have the 90 day history, you mm -hmm. will have to debt service it through your total debt servicing ratios. But as long as you have the funds in your account, the 90 days, we can use that as a form of traditional down payment. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really important that the funds have been in the account for 90 days and you can actually have the income to service the debt. If you can do that, then we could actually look at it as a traditional down payment method. Yeah, and then just touching on RSPs too, I would I would definitely recommend you reach out to a mortgage professional and, and talk to them beforehand before you kind of go ahead and take your RSPs out because there are some obviously uh, limiting factors when you use your RSPs uh, for a purchase. So before you kind of go ahead and preemptively take them out, just make sure you reach out to someone and, and you know make sure that that source of down payment um, is going to be able to fit the type of purchase that you're looking to make. So it's also really important to realize that we look at different um, loans. Uh, separately. So if your home equity line of credit, which is a secured loan, and a regular line of credit, which is an unsecured loan, mm -hmm. the balance on those are going to be reflected differently on your liabilities. So if it's a secured line of credit, we can use one and a half percent of the outstanding balance of that as your monthly payment. Whereas if it's an unsecured line of credit, we have to use 3% of the outstanding mm -hmm. balance as your monthly payment. Even though your payment's $250 a month, you know, the bank doesn't really care about that. They care about the 3% of the outstanding balance, which could be drastically different than what you're actually paying per month. Mm -hmm. All right, so now moving on with residential mortgages, something that's really popular with my audience is house hacking. So it's like my number one life hack really, in my opinion, is live for free. And so one of the best ways to live for free is really buy a multifamily, live in one unit and rent out the others and essentially get paid to live for free if you're doing it right. So when we're looking at house hacking, what's kind of the minimum amount of money I can get away with when I'm getting into that property and I know I'm gonna be living there myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if you're in the ability we're um, in the situation that you have the ability to make you know an insured purchase um, on a property you know looking into a duplex uh, a triplex or even a fourplex can be a great opportunity um, as long as you haven't you know purchased a home with CMHC before or one of the other insurance companies you know you're able to get into a one to uh, one to two unit building with five percent down um, so that's a great option to be able to get in. You know, you're saving some cash flow right out of the gate, and you know, like you said, you're going to be able to move in and have somebody else help paying off, you know, the mortgage for you and, and taking care of some of those costs. Um, now, if you're a little more adventurous and you're maybe looking at a three to four unit, um, you know, with an insured purchase, you're able to get in with as little as 10% down. Um, so again, you're saving that extra 10% that you'd have to make on any other traditional, you know, uninsured purchase. Uh, put that towards cash flow, or maybe renovating the room a little bit so that you're able to come in and bring in a tenant and maximize the of rent they're paying to help you know offset the mortgage co mortgage cost for you to the utmost ability of that room yeah when trying to factor in down payment and how much you're going to need for your down payment for this house hack or a multifamily residential mm -hmm. property it's important to also realize that you have to have most lenders try to see that you have one and a half percent of the purchase price of the property in your bank account for closing costs so a lot of people will just save up $35,000 or $40,000, yeah. but they won't realize that that additional cost is there and that they have to meet that requirement to close in the transaction. And some lenders, depending on the type of property and you as a buyer, um, will also require that you have three to 12 months of, uh, of rent in your bank account to show that you can actually float the, uh, the investment as well. Yeah, and that's not necessarily for the subject property. That's if you know if you have three to four non-subject properties that's already in your portfolio. Um, I, I've had some lenders who want to see three months reserves for each of those four individual um, properties as well too, just because you know they're looking at risk. You know, if you happen to defer or you know any of your other tenants lose, they want to make sure that you're not going to be defaulting on that mortgage, which is going to come into effect on your current mortgage. So they may ask for reserves for all properties on the portfolio. Yeah, we're finding that specifically after COVID, that's become one of the things that most lenders are looking at. Um, we didn't see it as much previous to that, yeah. but um, I think it's just risk mitigation. For sure, yeah. Yeah, understandable. So now moving past, say, house hacking situations where I'm going to be using the property as a principal residence, what are the other options available when looking for lenders and low down payment options? 
Mm -hmm. So obviously we can take a look into the private financing. Um, you know, we like to use private financing that allows us to get super creative when we're helping um, investors get into their properties. Um, you know, when we're talking about private investors or, or private lenders, there's two types of private lenders that we kind of talk about. There's individual guys who have, you know, their own pool of money and they're able to broker a deal and, and put it out. Um, you know, they're pretty easy on what they're accepting for um, sources of down payment. Um, they're not too interested in looking at where that money came from. As long as you have, you know, the minimum 20% or 25%, whatever it is you guys have negotiated, um, they're good to go and they'll, you know, they'll move forward on the transaction. There's some mortgage investment companies that we work with um, and, you know, a lot of them are starting to follow the anti-money laundering rules and regulations. So you're still allowed to use non-traditional sources of down payment. So board funds, vendor takebacks, um, investment funds, but they may ask to see, you know, just where did that money come from? Maybe, um, you know, three months history of bank statements, just so that they know where that money's coming from, but they're not gonna, you know, kind of gawk at it if it's coming as a borrowed payment, just because they're following those AML laws. They just want to make sure it, it is clean money that's coming in. So yeah, uh, primarily private lending. You know, we, we like to structure our vendor take backs through private lending. A lot of B lenders won't touch it. Yeah, lenders definitely won't yeah. touch it. So I mean, it's a solution to be able to get you into the property. Um, we find that most mom and pop lenders are really flexible with being able to maybe find like a happy medium where their risk tolerance and the amount of money they're putting out um, is worth it. And if not, then we, I know we made a video on cross collateralization yeah. that we do it all the time. So if, if you guys can't meet the middle with your better take back and you, you know, you can't get the funds needed to close you know, using another property is always, uh, it's always helpful. And most of our mom and pop private lenders are, are okay with being able to mitigate risk that way. Yeah, absolutely. And so I know one of the things for a lot of beginner investors that's kind of frustrating when we're talking about private financing is the lack of clarity or standardization. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us, you know, as Canadians, we get trained upon the retail banking system. And so there's very rigid, like it's very rigid, right? Like you're a square peg, you need to fit in that square hole. That's the only option. And so a lot of investors come to private investing and at first they're like, well, what are the rules? And often they'll first hear like, well, there really is no rules, but there are kind of rules of thumb, right? And so there's relatively consistent patterns that I'm sure you guys see. So likely your average private lender, I'm going to guess wants a 75 to 80% loan to value, right? Like that's probably the bulk of your lenders that you're dealing with. And then so if we're moving past say those traditional kind of private lenders, what are the sort of compromises or ways that a investor can make a deal more enticing and maybe get away with a smaller down payment? So I know, Josh, you kind of mentioned trying to meet in the middle with a VTB. What are some of the things that you find are more enticing to lenders? Is it offering to pay a higher interest rate? Is it cross collateralizing? What are some of the creative options we have available in order to get in and realistically make that lower down payment deal? Because it's one thing to say it's possible to do a 100% finance deal. It's another to actually get that deal. Do you want to get control of your financial life? Do you want to crush it in real estate with wholesaling? Do you want to join my full-time team of wholesalers like Mike or Shahir? Or what about Tyler or Diego? Or what about Amar? All right, and what do we do, boys? We make offers, we buy fast. Never gonna miss a deal because we pay cash. Offers, 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 deals, deals, deals. Tell us, Mr. Seller, what price do you feel? Because we're Southwestern's biggest source of deals. Boom. So if you guys want to crush it with wholesaling, you need to join my team. And down below, video description, there's all the links you need. Because it's one thing to say it's possible to do a 100% finance deal. It's another to actually get that deal. Sure, absolutely. I think it all derives from you have to look at the lender's perspective. So the lender's perspective, it's always an equity position. They're a complete equity lender. Yeah. So it's always gonna come down to their equity position and how much is left in the property and mm -hmm. their risk towards that property. So I would say that the best option to a lender is gonna be an extra piece of collateral. Because mm -hmm. that extra piece of collateral is a hard, tangible asset that they understand, that they know, they can verify the value very quickly um, mm -hmm. and they trust it. The majority of these guys who are putting money out have made their money in real estate. They understand the value yeah. of it, they understand how it's gonna hold, and they trust it. So that's, that's basically the easiest way to get your deal done is to have another piece of collateral. I understand that it's not really viable for everybody to be able to have just an extra piece of land that has a bunch of money on it. Like, it's, <laughs> not everybody has that, but um, 
that is the, I guess, most ideal situation is to be able to use another piece of property. Okay, and I think that's actually a very practical tip for a lot of investors because even if you don't have that piece of property that you can cross collateralize on, hopefully someone in your network does. You know, there's a family member, a friend, potentially a JV partner that might have access to that. So is there anything else? We've really been just talking about one to four unit properties up until this point. Anything else we should hit on in this kind of niche of real estate before moving on to commercial guys? Um, I think just touching back on with the private, um, obviously vendor, um, collateral is a great way to help extend that loan to value and, and save on the down payment. Um, the next best thing is really just the vendor take back. You know, even if you can get someone to come in with a 10%, you know, that's going to shave off 10% that maybe you have to put down. And again, that's, you know, a little bit extra cash flow back in your pocket. Um, so in terms of cutting down initial costs, yeah, definitely collateral and or vendor take back if you have the options. And so the logic behind why a vendor take back actually cuts down is that that first place mortgage, their risk tolerance is still they feel relatively safe because they're in first place right so if things go wrong they're always made whole first where the VTB would be in second place so even though you might be at a 90% total loan to value with say an 80% first place uh, mortgage and 10% VTB from that first place mortgagers position at least worst case scenario you know there's 20% equity in theory there first where they can make themselves whole yeah and you know better take backs essentially act as a, as a private second mortgage but but, um, you know, some of the deals that we've seen people getting on better take backs in the cash flow tribunal, I've seen a few people getting high loan to values at 0% financing, right? So, um, I mean, why would you, you know, why would you take a look at a second when you're going to be paying, you know, 10 to 12% on that when you can get that same amount at 0% down, right? I mean, I would definitely go the better take back route before taking a look at uh, a private second to help get you in for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, it would cost less as well. Yeah. You know, there's, there's fees and there's yeah. on title and all that stuff as well. So. A vendor take back would definitely be the most cost efficient uh, solution before looking at a second mortgage. Okay, great. So let's move in now into the commercial space. So what's different and what sort of down payments are we looking at in the commercial space versus what we see in the retail one to four property space? Sure, yeah. So um, I think we spoke about it a little bit in the last few videos as well, but it's more of not fitting the square in the square box and the, and the circle mm -hmm. in the circle hole. It has a lot to do with you know the property. So we look at the debt service coverage ratio. Yeah. Um, so depending on the tier of commercial lender, they're looking at 1.1 to 1.2 debt service coverage. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to look at the strength of the borrower. Do you have other properties? Is this your first giant multiplex property? Um, your credit. Do you have uh, history in paying off credit? Is mm -hmm. it established? How long have you had serious credit for? Yeah. Um, if you're buying it through a corporation, your corporate financials, what do those look like? Is there history with those? Um, the primarily, you're looking at about 25 to 35% down. Um, if you're looking institutionally, possibly more, depending on the strength of you as a borrower and if you have the ability to pay it back. Um, there are a few things that they also take a look at, which is a capital reserve. So mm -hmm. Do you have any money to be able to cover maybe some of the expected costs associated with yeah. the um, with the property, so it doesn't need a new roof, you know, does it need new fire doors, did people kick doors in, <laughs> does it happen? Mm -hmm. um, lots of different things, so the lenders always try to look at it from more of a conservative angle, they're trying to find, you know, can this person support these payments, and obviously debt service coverage ratios or personal debt servicing is going to be out to lunch. Like, a lot of people don't have the income to qualify by themselves for these giant properties, but you know if their corporation has retained earnings and you can show that their portfolio, mm -hmm. and they have an ability to be able to pay their things on time or pay their bills on time, and they have a property management company who takes care of it all, and you know an established yeah. person, you know, as you move into larger real estate, you know your basically your resume needs to grow with you, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just keep being like a small time investor if you could buy a big property. Mm. So it has a lot to do with, uh, with who you are and the property in general. Yeah, and just to follow up on Josh, you know, there's still some of the same um, tools that we can use to um, help mitigate upfront uh, costs on the down payment. So, you know, if you do happen to be looking for a commercial building and you, you know, maybe you need private funds, they're still open to looking at collateralization of other properties. Um, and there are commercial uh, sellers out there who are also doing vendor take backs as well too on commercial properties. And, I, and I've seen it done on, on vacant land as well too. So um, it's more the lender that you're working with that kind of determines what type of tools and 
and tricks you're going to be able to use, uh, not so much the actual kind of property itself. Okay, and let's explore one other aspect when it comes to commercial properties. Um, and we're kind of using a broad term here because commercial sometimes means different things. But a lot of investors, when they're moving into larger multifamily properties, one of the first things they hear from fellow investors is, oh, it's awesome because you can put less down because CMHC, you can do 15%. Do you guys mind just exploring that? Because again, I find that to be one of those things that we hear about it in theory, but then when you go to implement it in practice based upon where the per unit pricing is and the cash flow that you can usually get when you buy a property, that sometimes that 15% CMHC deal doesn't actually work out the way you think it should. <laughs> sure, yeah, no, I can touch on that. I'm actually dealing with a, a deal that came on my desk. And so you know, we went to go finance it conventionally and mm -hmm. most of the lenders who are looking at that type of real estate, it's about 10 to 30 units and it's under a million dollars mm. so there are, they were basically like you know we can't we're not going to give you a loan on the property if it's not CMHC insured under a million dollars and unfortunately it wasn't pristine as to what they what CMHC requirements would would need so yeah it kind of falls out of that CMHC uh, lending guideline um, and their loan to value is about 65% so you know you might mitigate a little bit of the down payment but um, the the type of property you're looking at for CMHC financing is a almost a turnkey property. It's, it mm -hmm. has to have a handful of different things, requirements that CMHC look for to be able to qualify for that type of financing. So in, in theory, and you know, some, some places do have it, but in theory, it's a really great idea, but sometimes it just doesn't work out for maybe the undervalued properties that some people are looking at. And it also depends on the area as well, right? So yeah. own the value is really on a sliding scale. If you're in the middle of nowhere, it's probably going mm -hmm. down a little bit. If you're downtown Toronto, you know, lenders, lenders understand and they'll probably go higher loan to value, right? Mm -hmm. So the next thing that we're probably, or you know, investors might come across when they're looking more towards the commercial and getting into that development, um, land acquisition. So um, COVID obviously had a bit of a bit of effect, um, you know, during kind of the peak seasons, um, lenders had either stopped kind of lending out on land acquisition and temporarily held off or, you know, really reduced their loan of values, putting it down to like 50% um, and, and not really moving much more on, on that end. Um, we're getting back into a little bit more of normalcy now. Um, there's a couple, um, you know, venture capitalists and, and investment companies out there who are pushing land acquisitions, you know, up to 60, 65%. Um, there's a few things that it's going to determine you know like where is the property is it located out in the middle of nowhere or is it in you know prime area that's um has slowly being developed out and you're just in the next tranche of developments um what does the land look like you know, is it completely unserviced? Has it, is it raw land? Uh, is it service land? Has it passed, you know, environmentals? Is it site plan approved? Like, where is it at in that stage as well too? Um, and then the application and the portfolio of the buyer, right? If you're a brand new developer um, and you're looking to do your first, you know, small condominium development, or maybe you're just looking at putting up, uh, you know, like a 12 unit um, uh, multifamily, mm -hmm. what does your history look like? Have you been able to pull off these developments before? Um, you know, are you successful with it? Um, maybe you have a joint venture partner that's going to bring some strength to it that has, you know, some previous experience. Um, so lenders are essentially just looking at mitigating risks and, you know, is this guy going to walk away from the project if he, you know, if it gets difficult and he starts to run out of funds or, you know, does he have the experience and the knowledge to be able to stick it out and complete it to the uh, fulfillment. So a lot of it has to do with your own cash equity in the mm -hmm. property as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously 50, 60% loan to value on, on land is a large cash position in yeah. development to begin with. And then all the costs associated with either rezoning or changing uh, to site plan approval and all those different environmentals and reports and geotechnicals and all those things cost quite a bit of money. Most lenders, when you're looking for financing, are going to ask specifically for your cash equity position mm -hmm. in the property, just because the lift and the value of the property, once you rezone it to the highest and best use case, or like once you get the site plan approval, the value jumps quite significantly. So there's, it's obviously extremely lucrative, but a lot of lenders want to see that you have skin in the game because it's quite risky for them as a lender, because being able to sell off raw pieces of land can be extremely difficult at times. Yeah. Awesome guys, well that's a great breakdown when it comes to down payments here in Canada. If people want to reach out or learn more about this process, what's the best way to get in contact with you guys? Yeah, so we have a website, you can fill out a form on our website, feel free to call us. Uh, my phone number is going to be below and Aaron's will also be below um, in the comment description. So just reach out, we're always happy to chat, we work all the time, 24-7, 365. If you need to call us at 10 o'clock, give us a call, you know, it doesn't matter where you live in Canada, BC, 
out east. We, we, yeah, we, <laughs> we take all the calls, guys. So yeah. feel free to reach out. We're always happy to talk. If you just have any questions um, about starting your investment journey, um, anything in regards to specific questions for building or buying or developing, feel free to reach out. We're always happy to help. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Awesome. Love it, guys. And yeah, if you didn't know, I actually used Josh and Aaron myself for some of our bigger deals. So I can say that when things start to get a little bit tough on a deal, they really do push through and like we get the deal done. That's what really matters. So again, in real estate, it is definitely a roller coaster, but it's important that you have great team members on your power team because that's what's going to allow you to go the extra mile. And the money's in the 20s, so it's really about not getting it at 80% done, but taking it that extra 20%. So if you guys are interested in reaching out to the guys we'll throw a link to all their uh, contact information down below otherwise we'll see you guys in the next video Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks again to the Finlay guys for breaking down the requirements when it comes to down payments, especially with investment properties here in Canada. If you guys didn't know, this is part of our Finance Fridays with the Finlay team. You guys definitely need to make sure you're subscribed. Hit that notification bell because every Friday, we're going to be dropping great information and tips when it comes to financing your real estate deals. And I find this to be one of the most intimidating parts of the real estate investing journey when I talk to brand new beginner investors. So if you guys are currently struggling to get your deals financed or you're not sure where to start, either you can reach out to Finlay directly and we're going to throw a link to all their contact information in the video description down below or jump into that comment section, hit us up with your questions. They're usually pretty good at responding, but if it slips through the cracks, we'll answer it on a future YouTube video. So make sure you hit us up in the comment section. Otherwise, if you want more great videos about financing, check out these Finance Friday videos with the Finlay team or check out these videos. Again, we've shot a lot of videos with the guys so far, but we plan on shooting a lot more videos as well. So if you've got suggestions, if you've got critiques, if you've just got questions, hit us up in that comment section down below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video.